Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Grace and peace to everyone. This is Apostle Dr. Antonio Lee Wright, Senior Pastor and Founder of Kingdom Expectation Ministries, and this is our Double Dip Tuesday Night Bible Study. I'm a few minutes behind, but we're going to get started. It's now 7.32. We'll wait for a few people to get on, and I'm also looking on two different screens. That way, if I miss here, I catch it there. What do you think? Hey, Sharika, how you doing? Ain't seen you in a minute. See, on this screen, I see you, but on this screen, I don't. How are you doing? Uh, amen. God bless you, Pastor Carlos. First Lady Lawson, I see y'all. My wife is on. Hey, wife. Uh, I don't know why I didn't see Sharika up there. Glad to see you, though. Amen. God is good. So we, we appreciate everybody who's coming on. Uh, I did something dumb. I forgot my handkerchief but I'll be all right. Dr. Rick, bless you, sir. Dr. Carolyn, bless you, ma'am. I enjoyed you this morning, Dr. Rick. Great word. Amen. Amen. I was late going to the gym. I was able to listen. Amen. 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 So we're grateful for all that are coming on. Uh, tonight, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, we've already finished up the Song of Songs. Hey, Dr. Troy, how you doing? We've already finished up the... Hey, Sister Tanya, more. Got a couple of y'all. <laughs> God is good. Uh, we finished up the Song of Songs. Uh, hey, Z, how you be? So what I want to do for tonight and next Tuesday, uh, before I go in, I think I'm going to go in the gifts of the Spirit again, uh, just for the sake of teaching. I'm going to try to stick with my notes and not with what I know. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm doing a type. Uh, I'm doing an allegory, if you will, or share with you some allegorical views of the Song of Songs and the marriage to God. Uh, so we're going to break down some of the things in the Song of Songs and show you the type between Solomon and the Shulamite and our marriage, our relationship like a marriage with God the Father. Uh, so if you give me just tonight and next Tuesday night, that's something I want to share uh, and some of you are to help, especially if those of you are not in ministry or not pastors. And sometimes you wonder how we come up with these different types of thought or these different types of revelations. Well, you'll hear some of that tonight. And all of it basically comes with is your study. You know, I, I, re I remember when I, um, when I first gave my life to the Lord and I didn't know. Well, yes, I did. I think as I first gave my life to the Lord, I was a reader and a faster. I knew, I knew nothing about fasting. And I automatically uh, started fasting like every other day. Hey, Stephanie, how are you doing? And look like we have William on. William, how are you doing? So I actually started fasting like every other day. I knew nothing of fasting. I come out of a background of going to Catholic school and Lutheran school and being raised in a Baptist ministry type home. So I knew nothing about fasting. They didn't teach us that. So God automatically instructed me to start fasting every other day. Uh, hey, Cranberry. Uh, and so from that point, when I got ready to go to Germany, once I hit Germany, hit the, hit the, hit the ground, literally, God says, I'm preparing you for ministry. And at that point, he told me to get a Bible dictionary. Good morning, Pamela. How you doing? He told me to get a Bible dictionary, a Vines Expository Dictionary, uh, and uh, a Dake's Bible. Uh, and that started this journey, if you will. So I'm sharing with you tonight, this is how I study. So, I, you know, anybody that knows, but I teach the way I study uh, because I want people to really comprehend and understand the word of God. So what we're doing tonight is I stated, and I'm going to pray so we can get started. Uh, we're going to do, again, going back over the Song of Songs, but I'm going to give you an allegorical view. Allegorical is a type. So we're going to look at some allegories or some types between the marriage, Solomon and the Shulamite, and our marriage with the Lord. Amen, Dr. Rick. That's, that's a fact. Hey, that's a fact. The, 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 the concealed is only revealed in the search. And you know me, Dr. Rick. I like searching. Uh, so let's pray real quick and get into this. I got a good hour. Uh, any questions? I'm looking at two screens because I've noticed whatever shows on my phone does not show on my iPad. So you'll see me drifting. I'm not going to sleep. Other than this morning, you know, Dr. Rick, I missed my tea this morning. I drank some cold water, and that's what caused me to cough. And tonight I have tea, 
And it's probably late, but it's still going to be great. I'm going to sip it a little bit. So let's pray. Father, we bless you. We glorify you. We magnify you as always, God. We thank you just for the opportunity to be able to share your word. We pray, Father, that the ears of the hearer might be open to receive your word and that that word that they receive might be watered by the Holy Spirit in which you might receive from them to yourself some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And I, as your son, as your servant, as your shepherd, as I prepare to share the word, I ask that you would bless me with revelation, knowledge, spiritual wisdom, and divine understanding of the word, and that you be glorified in everything that I say, as I'm an oracle for you this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. The door. Amen, 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 amen. We good? Oh, so so, so I'm going to do my best. You know me with my notes. I'm going to stick with my notes. So this is basically a review of the Song of Songs, but it's an allegorical view. Allegory just means a type. And there's so many types and similes in the Bible. And sometimes we miss that when we just read it. And even when I was teaching the book of Psalms, we miss the songs in Psalms because it's hard to translate and or transliterate Hebrew into English. So we miss some of the passion that is put into the words. Uh, and we'll find some of that out even this evening. So what we have in the Song of Songs is a book with only 117 verses, but it has 470 Hebrew words, 47 of them which appear only in the book of the Song of Songs. Yet it is among the least studied and the most emotionally controversial. Remember I told you myself when I taught it, uh, I've never taught the Song of Songs. I've taught every book in the Bible except for this. And Pastor Seawright had mentioned it, and I said, you know what, I'm going to do it. So I, I've shared it uh, in marriage seminars or, or, or heard of it taught in marriage seminars because of the sexual content in it. Uh, and at one time, memory serves me correctly, I believe the rabbi said that if you read it, you had to be over 20. I want to say he said you had to be 30, but I don't know. I don't remember the exact age. And that's because of the sexual content that's in it. Uh, but I believe we all were adults and I, I got fed. I got blessed just by teaching it and studying it myself. So it is the most least studied and most emotionally controversial uh, book in the Bible. The book itself is inspired. It was part of the scriptures uh, when Jesus Christ was here on earth. Hey, Pastor C. Wright and family. Uh, he put his imp imprimatur on it. Imprimatur is just a word of saying a person's acceptance or guarantee that something is of a good structure or something is of a good standard. So it's almost like we're saying that he put his seal of approval on it. Uh, imprimatur is one of the words that the, 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 the rabbis or the priests would use or uh, the uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church would use as far as something being a uh, right to be placed in the canon. They would call it, uh, they would put their imprimatur on it or their stamp of approval. Uh, and of course, he did that on the entire volume when he said the scripture cannot be broken in John uh, 10 verse 35. And it was the favorite book. Uh, hey, Taylor, it was the favorite book of people such as D.L. Moody and C.H. Spurgeon and St. John of the Cross. And for those of you who are theologians or just study, uh, these are some guys that we always uh, make reference to some of their reading and some of their their uh, literature. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16, we understand it was divinely inspired. Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness. All scripture is profitable in four ways. It is profitable for doctrine, and that's what's right. It is uh, 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 profitable for reproof, and that's what's not right. It is profitable for correction, uh, and that's how to get right. And it is profitable for instruction in righteousness. And that's how you stay right. So you got four things. Uh, how, how, how to be reproved, how to be correct uh, when things are not right, how to get right, and for instructions in righteousness so you can stay right. So again, uh, I'm just giving you an allegorical view, a type of the different types that's in the Song of Songs as we get ready uh, uh, to understand or comprehend even deeper the type it has between the marriage between Solomon and the Shulamite and our marriage to God himself. So if you recall the outline of the Song of Psalms, you had five idols, and an idol is nothing more than a short poem or musical work descriptive of rustic life. So the Song of Songs is literally just that, uh, and it is considered an idol. Again, that's a short poem or musical work descriptive of rustic life. So the Song of Songs is separated into five idols and 13 reflections. 
uh, uh, and we find that, you know, the first three deal with the wedding day, the courtship period, and the marital union. Uh, and then the fourth and fifth idol gives us the sexual problem and the return to Galilee. In the middle of that, in the Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 16, and to chapter 5, verses 1, we have the consummation if, of the marriage, if you will. Uh, and all of that is in uh, the Song of Songs. Um, of course, the climax of the book, as we all know, is in the middle. So there's some key lessons. So I want to share with you the key lessons from the literal view. Uh, the fact that God has a high view on marriage, a very high view. Uh, we understand that the highest view of sexuality, the deepest aspects of our personhood is uh, observed in the sexual content of marriage. And it's only in the marriage context that this is understood or this is uh, loved by God. Uh, it can be profaned by either extreme of, a, of asceticism or lust. Now, what is asceticism? So now I'm going to mess up some people's form of theology. Asceticism is extreme self-discipline and avoidance to all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. So in other words, what is saying here is when you separate yourself uh, from marriage or you choose not to be married and God didn't tell you to, or you abstain from any uh, 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 sexual advances from your spouse, uh, for religious reasons and not trying to get into indulge, indulgence from with your mate, then you have just profaned the things of God as reference to marriage. Uh, remember that, uh, hey, uh, uh, Dick and Roxy, I can't pronounce the last name, but how y'all doing? Uh, remember that when we get married, the Bible says that the man's body is no longer his, it belongs to the wife. And the wife's body is no longer hers, it belongs to the man. But everything, mind you, has to be consensual. And the marriage bed is not defiled. I'm not going to go back in the Song of Songs. Do you understand what that means? Uh, if you're under the age of 18, ask your parents. And we'll just keep it like that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and then how, this, how, this is how the bridegroom, and these are the key lessons of the literal views in the Song of Songs. So, there's ways that the bridegroom views his bride. Uh, his, his similes, his similes uh, are, are, you know, he was talking about her hair was like goat's hair. And, and to us, that's negative. But to them in that day, he was talking about the representation of the long, shiny black hair of the mountain goats in that particular area and how it glistened upon the bronze stone during the sunlight. So he said, that's how beautiful she was. So all of his similes always eclipse her. In other words, they're always gratifying her, always glorifying her, always exalting her. He invariably views her without defect. In other words, everything she says, everything she does is perfect. This may be the most important lesson in the song. Now, I have issues when I see men and or women putting down their spouses because they have to realize you're really putting down yourself. Because there was only two people, Adam and me and Eve. And so out of Adam and Eve came all of us. So without being too silly, factually is your wife is your sister. Because all of us came from Adam and Eve. That'll mess you up. So if you're disrespecting your wife, you're literally disrespecting your blood. And that has nothing to do with marriage. That has everything to do with Bible. I see you looking. You got so. But you want to go a little deeper than that? <laughs> a little bit. When you think about Adam, Adam really loved himself. Because she was him that was taken out of his rib. So Adam was really making... Really loving himself. Hey, Michelle, how you doing? <laughs> That's deep. No, Adam was loving yes, himself because he, he was taken out of that. Yes. So Go, he, girl. You know, that was so bad. That, that was, was bone of his bone. That was bone, flesh, flesh of, of his, his flesh. flesh. So therefore, he, he loved himself. And loved himself so to death. Love your, love your wife as you love yourself. <laughs> He's so slow. <laughs> I like that, though. That's tight. I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at me either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. We having fun. <laughs> What's up, Diggy Gary? Oh, God. Diggy Gary said, you are spot on. To God be the glory. Oh, Sorry. God. That's too funny. <laughs> and so now let's look at the importance of communication. Uh, there has to be continual verbal affirmations. You know, anybody that knows me know that I have issues. Uh, it's hard for me to know that you care for me or that you love me or that you respect me if I never see it and I never hear it. And everybody periodically needs some kind of affirmation. 
to know that you really do care about the individual that's your friend or your, your relationship or your wife or, or whatever. People need to know. So even in this thing, uh, there's an importance of communication in the Song of Songs because you see there's always continual verbal affirmations. Uh, so you need to learn yourself to be the cheerleader, to be the champion, to be the companion, to be the one that compliments uh, the other. Uh, and that's even in friends. So all my friends, and I let them know how much I care about them, how much they mean to me, especially because, you know, friends is something that we, very, we have very few of. Uh, and sometimes we treat them like trash. So you got to be mindful of that. Or the people that mentor you, the people that, that, that guard you, uh, 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 the people that protect you. You see, Pam, she said, hey, mom, oh. love you too. Uh, uh, those people, you have, to, you have to be cognizant of these people in your life and make sure that you communicate with them the fact that they do mean something to you. So let's go back into this song of songs. So now we got to deal with foxes. And remember, we, we talked about dealing with foxes. What's up, Deacon Jerry? We talked about dealing with foxes earlier uh, when we was teaching the song of songs. So what is a fox? Foxes represent as many obstacles or temptations as have plagued lovers throughout the centuries. Uh, perhaps it is the fox of uncontrolled desire, which then drives a wedge uh, of guilt between a couple. Perhaps it is the fox of mistrust and jealousy, which breaks the bond of love. Or it may be the fox of selfishness and pride, uh, which refuses to let one acknowledge his fault to another. Or it may be an unforgiving spirit which will not accept the apology of the other. These particular foxes, if you will, have been ruining vineyards for years and the end of their work is not in sight. So, you know, there's certain things uh, uh, that couples have allowed to hinder them for years. And for some reason or another, they don't take care of them foxes ahead of time. Mm -hmm. You need to kill the fox uh, because the fox is always, and you know, it's funny. I say this because I remember uh, as a kid, I think I was like 13, 14 or somewhere my teenage years. I can't remember when. And they told me that my aunt and uncle had divorced. And I'm trying to figure out how you get divorced after you married almost 60 years. Mm. Hey, D, how do you get divorced after you've been married that long? I don't, I don't understand it. But the reason they got divorced after that long, because the foxes had got in. And, you know, and like I was sharing the other week when we were sitting here, and I think my wife was in here on that lesson. You know, when you marry a person, you're marrying four or five generations. I'm not talking about four or five generations of their past. Uh, let me change that. You're not marrying four or five. You marry four or five people. Now, there's ways that we've analyzed that by saying, well, you first meet the person. You're not really meeting the, for the real person. You're meeting the representative. I'm not even going that. I'm not even going that far. I'm going a little deeper because as you age, you change. The, when you age, you know, they used to say when, when, when older guys, uh, they like fast cars. As they get older, they want fast cars. Uh, I've always dressed. Uh, they just do things, think differently. You know, I like to stay in the gym because I like to be healthy. But there's always something different. You know, my attitude is a lot different now than when I first got married. Uh, I'm glad my wife stayed with me after we first got married because I was just a flipping idiot. I was a control freak and I had to learn through the years. I hope I'm doing okay. I learned through the years how not to be a control freak. So we grow and we change. So you have to marry all them changes uh, uh, in a marriage and you have to deal with them foxes as they raise up to make sure everything stays good. Uh, so then again, let's, let's keep going. So then we have uh, the fact that fact, something I said earlier, <laughs> Tanisha said, yeesh, Lord. <laughs> Yeah, girl, there's some changes, baby, there's some changes. So we're one flesh, each now owns one another. And I, I, I stated that earlier, uh, uh, Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 7, uh, all permitted, which is mutually accepted. So my body's not mine, it's my wife's. My wife's body's not hers, it's mine. Uh, and everything that we do has to be consensual and the marriage bed is undefiled. Uh, we're gonna, not going to mess with that. Uh, if you put a chainsaw in there, that's up to you. But we just going to keep it going. Uh, but just understand that. Now, that's the literal. These are more of the literal views, not the allegorical views of the book of the Song of Songs. So we finished the Song of Songs last week. I'm just giving you different viewpoints as we go into this. So another literal view for the Song of Songs, the fact that this book is intended to improve uh, to improve dying or empty, boring marriages, uh, to increase uh, your love for your spouse and to illuminate true sexual and romantic understanding. Uh, but then there's more to the book than that. 
And the reason we say that is because we not, we look at it uh, from a sexual point as far as husband and wife. And I also need you to understand, for those who are single, you still need to know the Song of Songs because you need to know what to expect out of your mate. And I always tell women, especially women, they're bad at this. They always look for a man. No, no, no. The Bible says, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And so some of the problems are you looking at the wrong thing at the wrong places because God didn't tell you to look anyway. Right. God told you to be married to him. Fast, pray, study your word, stay focused, do what God is telling you to do. And when the time is right, he'll send that man your way. And trust me, you'll know when it's that man, not just somebody that looks good and smells good because, you know, might not look all that pleasing, but he might be the one that'll please you. Anyway, so let's get into this allegorical view. And again, uh, allegorically, uh, allegorical symbolizes something that's a little broader. So we're looking at the allegorical aspect of the Song of Songs, which was written by Solomon. Uh, if we look at that and dealing with the, uh, um, the introduction of this, if you will, uh, there's other common views among both Jewish and Christian evangelicals, uh, which are their allegorical views. Uh, the Jewish tradition or the Mishnah or the Talmud, as we know, and the Targum viewed the book as an allegorical picture of the love of God for Israel. Israel is indeed portrayed as the wife of Yahweh. Uh, we see that in Hosea and, and Ezekiel. But then others see the book of the Song of Songs as a type of Christ's love for the church. Uh, all scripture speaks in some way of the glory and beauty of our Messiah. Uh, Psalm 40, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Uh, Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And so now we have some church leaders, including Hipp Hippolytus, Origen, Jerome, Athanasius, August, Augustine, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux have viewed the book as an allegory of Christ's love for his bride, the church, which is why I'm explaining it this way tonight and next week to look at the allegorical view of the type of not just Solomon and the Shulamite, but just also look at the type of us and our marriage to the Lord himself. Uh, and then there's a third allegorical view of uh, the courtship between Christ and the individual believer should be considered. Uh, the figure of the bride and the bridegroom is a frequent symbol in scripture. And that's everywhere. Uh, just a few of them. Isaiah 61 and 10. Isaiah 62 and 5. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 7 and 34. Jeremiah 16 and 9. Jeremiah 25 and 10. We can go on and on. Matthew 9 and 15. Uh, Matthew 25 verses 1 through 10. Mark 2 verses 19 and 20. And we can, can, can continue to go, but I'm going to pause because it's a lot. Uh, uh, and then we understand that nobody has ever literally entered the truth of communion with Christ until he himself has become the all absorbing passion of the soul. So in other words, it's just not salvation. Uh, it's, it's a little further uh, than salvation. It's just not salvation or accepting Christ. It's the passion that you get for learning and knowing Christ, the passion that you have for having the desire to know Christ. And again, I, I try not, when I, when I, I, I alluded to this somewhat earlier, uh, when I first gave my life to the Lord, I'd raised hell so many years. Uh, I'd been high so many years. I'd, I'd messed up so many lives. I'd turned so many people out. When I finally gave my life to the Lord, and, and it's not that I didn't know, know better. You know, they say, when you know better, you do better. I knew better. I just didn't want to do better. And a lot of it had to do with what I saw other people doing. And so we still have that same issue with the church today because I teach different. Uh, I teach Bible. I don't teach perspectives. I don't teach judgment. Uh, I, I teach the Bible. I teach a relationship with God. And so I try to compel men. When, when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's just not a get to heaven ticket uh, because we're not going to heaven. He gave us a kingdom. Uh, when you really get into Christ and accept Christ, you should have a desire to get all of Christ. You should have a desire to know all of Christ. You should have a desire for him to take all of you. And, and when you get that, it's, it's like a marriage. You're, you're consumed with it. And so some people say, well, that's all you know is God, God, God. But that's all I know because that's all I am because I've allowed him to take over me as I take over him. And once I, you know, I can't even explain how great that is. Now that took some more years, uh, some years. And I'm going to say this and get out of this and get back in. I, I text one of my godsons today and I had to apologize to him 
without getting emotional. I repented to him because there were some things back in the day that I taught against. There's some things back in the day I judged people on. And I judged people on and I taught them against it because that's what I was taught. I was basically taught that. And so once I started seeking after the kingdom of God the past 10, 11, 12 years, I started understanding and, 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 and comprehending the Bible from a, a true kingdom biblical aspect. So I had... I. Send him a text message and apologize to him. I repented to him. Why? Because when you know better, you do better. And you have to even understand this. So when I'm sharing this with you, when you understand the love that God has for you and the desire that God has for you to be blessed and, and, and to be overcomers and, and to be upright before him so he can give you every, all the access to his kingdom, you share that with others. And that's, that's the marriage. That's the marriage. You don't want to do anything to disrespect your wife. Your wife don't want to do anything to disrespect you. It's kind of like your name. Your name is all you... In the South, I was taught this. Your name is the only thing you got. And if you fail your name, like you don't keep your promises, then it's over. Ixnay, out. They'll say, yeah, that's that right boy. Yeah, that's that right boy. Why? Because that right boy did what he wasn't supposed to do. So you don't want to damage that. You don't want to damage nothing from God. You had something? Yeah, I was just going to add to that. Not only your name, but your word. Yeah, your word. That, that, that should be like gold. Um, a lot of people will say things, but then... They justify what they say because something they didn't really want to do. They was in the moment. Right. The, so your word is your bond. When you say something, mean it, do it, and deliver it. Because God holds you accountable for that word that you gave. That's you right. He does. You're going to do. be accountable for that. That's right. Because that become a lie. Yep. <laughs> He's so slow. You so slow. Amen. 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 So check as we keep going to this. I pray you're being blessed. Uh, 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 so uh, again, of course, you know, one other guy, of course, is John the Baptist, uh, the last of the Old Testament prophets recognized Christ as the bridegroom. Uh, uh, so we appreciate that. So uh, thank God for all the hearts and the thumbs up. Mm -hmm. So then there's the use of rhetorical devices. And as we get into this even further, rhetorical devices are figures of speech, if you will. Uh, then we have the Hebrew hermeneutics. I'm going to try to get into that tonight because Hebrew hermeneutics looks at the Bible a different way than our hermeneutics does. And we have to be mindful of that. So again, I say, you know, a doctrine and theology and doctrine and ministry. But I learned more outside of that because I understood Jesus was a Jew. So in order for me to understand the Bible, I had to understand the Jewishness in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus was not a Christian. Jesus was a Jew. So to be Christ-like means to be Jew-like, Jewish-like. I mean, that's just the bottom line. That's, that's it. Uh, the, old, the, the New Testament was written from a Jewish theology, not a New Testament theology. Everything they taught in the New Testament was the Old Testament, which was a Hebrew-Jewish theology. And they taught us a Hebrew-Jewish theology. We don't want to try to Christianize it and make it seem like it's different. It's really not. It's all Jewish. Uh, but the catch is it did not, it came outside of the law. Because he said, look, I'm doing something greater than the law. What the law could not do, I'm doing when I shed my blood. I'm not going to get into that. It's going to take me too far away. And so we also understand as we get into this, we're going to deal with the fact that Solomon was a collector of dark sayings. Uh, uh, and then we're going to do some other samples of some allegorical illusions. Uh, we're going to deal with Rahab, Scarlet Thorn, and then we're going to deal with our life in this garden. I'm going to try to get all that done in the next 30 minutes. What you think? So there's a personal spiritual application to this in Revelation 3 verses 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. If any man, if any man, if any man, because in other words, Jesus is all, you know, Jesus didn't find us. He knew where we was. We got him. See, he was always waiting, knocking on the door like, okay, y'all ready? Y'all ready? I want to come in. Here I am. And, and, and that's the personal application of the personal spiritual application, if you will. Now, remember in Revelations 3 and 20, this was spoken to the church of Laodicea, uh, the Laodicean church. Uh, so, so, so my question would be to you that I wrote down, uh, have you responded to him? Have you responded to the call? Have you responded to the knock? Have you responded to the fact that Jesus is beckoning you to have all of you? Have, have you responded or are you guilty of the sin of lethargy? You know, I'm just not, I'm just, think about it. Just food for thought, just food for thought. So then we look at, and I said earlier about uh, rhetorical devices or figures of speech. Uh, he, Hosea 12 and 10. I have also spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes, similitudes uh, by the ministry of the prophets. Uh, uh, so be mindful of that. Similitudes, <laughs> metaphors, allegories, analogies, and types 
are but a few of the rhetorical uh, devices that are found in the Bible. In the Bible, we have over 200 different kinds have been cataloged with specific references and applications. Uh, and he said this in Hosea. He says, look, uh, uh, I've, I've spoken by my prophets and I've multiplied vision and I've used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. So these are different things that, that he uses. And there's so many uh, rhetorical devices uh, that I mentioned in the Song of Songs that we talked about earlier. Uh, they talked about the gazelle, the roe and the heart. Uh, they talked about horses and goats and sheep. Uh, they talked about the dove and the turtle dove. And they talked about feist, foxes and, and spices and, and fragrances. Uh, now, now, it's not so much as the animals uh, that they were alluding to or he was alluding to, but the behavior like the animals, the look, the glory, the stature of the animals. These were the idioms uh, that Solomon was using in the Song of Songs, and they were understood in that culture to whereas we don't understand it in that way. And we might say, well, what does he mean by, you know, nestle in her, her, her grapes? What kind of grapes are you talking about? <laughs> well, you stupid if you don't know what kind of grapes. Did I just say stupid? <laughs> My bad. You kind of slow if you don't know what kind of grapes you're talking about. But I do understand if you don't know about the goat's hair and her hair looking like goat's hair. And he said at one particular place that her teeth was like ivory. I'm like, you know, ivory is tight and it's all together and shiny, but that's another subject. Those are rhetorical devices. Then we have, huh? Okay, then we got types. So in 1 Corinthians 10, Pam is cracking up. We got types. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Uh, so now we're dealing with a type. Uh, uh, in the Hebrew, that word is tupos. Uh, that's when we look at, um, now these things were our examples. So the Hebrew word for examples is tupos, T-U-P-O-S. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. My Hebrew ain't all that good yet. Uh, the mark of a stroke, a blow, a uh, print, an example in the technical sense, the pattern and conformity to which a thing must be made, an example to be imitated, a person or thing pref a person or thing prefiguring a future, or uh, something messianic in that person or thing. So he talks about now these things were our examples. So he's talking about this pattern or this conformity, uh, uh, this thing, this, uh, uh, this blow, this print, uh, this example is to be imitated. So when he's talking about that, that is some of the things that he's meaning. We have 1 Corinthians 10 and 4, if you will, and did all drink the same spiritual drink for the drink of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Jesus. Of course, the rock in 1 Corinthians 10 4 is another type. Uh, and there's some other types. Uh, we have the rock twice. We have the rock in 1 Corinthians 10 and 4. Actually, we have it more than twice. We have it uh, peanut butter and jelly. There's the rock in 1 Corinthians 10 and 4. Then we have the rock in Exodus 17, and we have the rock in Numbers 20. So the rock in, F in Exodus uh, chapter 17 was the rock at Rephidim, and that's when God had Moses to strike the rock, and when he struck the rock, water came out of the rock. Now, when he went to the rock again at Meribah, he was supposed to speak to the rock, and water would come out, but instead of speaking to the rock, he got upset with the people and struck the rock. Now, because he was disobedient to the things of God, he couldn't walk into the promised land. He, he eventually was in the promised land by spirit, but he couldn't walk over to the promised land because he struck the rock, and God said, don't strike it, speak to it. He was disobedient and realizing that the type of the rock that he struck was not just a rock. It represented Christ and he wasn't supposed to be struck again. Amen. So these are other types. Then we have the brazen serpent. The brazen serpent uh, in Numbers 21 uh, was a type of Christ because when they put the serpent up and looked at the serpent, now the serpent was on a staff with a snake around it. I want you to look at the emblems that they now have on the, uh, on, on the EMTs in the hospitals and things. They got that. Well, all that comes from back then. Now I'm going to share with you some history on that. So whenever that, you know, the brazen serpents were striking them and killing them. So he said, get one, put it on a staff and lift it up. And whoever puts his eyes upon it, they'll be healed and delivered. Well, that's the same thing we do with Christ. Christ is up on the cross. Whenever we look up to him, we're healed, we're delivered and set free. But now they had to get rid of that because they used it as an idol. So here's some, some, some history. So they had some, 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 uh, what do you want to call them? Um, I guess temples. They had some temples with the staff and the snake. Here we go. They do it in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And they had poisonous snakes in the temple. And if you walked in the temple 
and a poisonous snake bit you and you came out the temple, they considered you was healed. I wonder how many bodies they had in that mm -hmm. joint. Uh, because he had done away with that. But they just had, so now you have these snake handlers in these Pentecostal churches in West Virginia, and they run around here with rattlesnakes, talking about, you know, they got the power to stick their hand in that monkey and he bite them. I ain't trying that. God said, don't play with him. I'm not going to tempt the Lord like that. But anyway, that's the brazen serpent. That's another type. Uh, then we have the Akadah in Genesis uh, uh, 22. And that's when Abraham was offering up Isaac. Notice Abraham was offering up Isaac on the same hill, the same hill that centuries later, Jesus got crucified on that same hill, on that same spot. So there's some types and God always does things in patterns. Uh, then there's Jonah and the fish. That's a type of Jesus' death. And most people say that Jonah didn't drown. Uh, the, the Jonah just drowned. Don't, Jonah didn't just drown. Jonah died. Hmm. You got to read the scripture. He died. And on the third day, this fish spit him out and God re brought him back. Why? Because hmm. he's God. That's another type. Uh, Joseph is a type of Christ. Uh, there's a hundred details that shows Joseph is a type of Christ in Genesis chapter 37 through 50. Uh, 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 of the coming of the Messiah. We'll get into that later. Then there's the ancient Jewish marriage that I dealt with in Song of Songs uh, and also in Ephesians 5. Now, all of these are allegorical impl implications or, or, or types uh, that are in the Bible that I just want to share with you tonight to give you some insight. And so now we have the Jewish marriage. And remember, I, I alluded to, I think it was chapter two or three, we was talking about the Jewish marriage and the Song of Songs. Uh, so the, the Jewish marriage has three particular distinct steps in the Jewish, ancient Jewish marriage. There's first of all, the betrothal. The betrothal is the time when the marriage arrangement for the marriage was contracted. Now, what you have to understand is when it was contracted, then the wife has to be a virgin. If she's not, she's in trouble. Then the wife uh, has some friends that hang around her. Here comes the story in the Bible about the virgins, the 10 virgins, the five wise and the five foolish. And most people say, well, why did the virgins hang around with her? They was keeping her out of trouble. That's right, keeping her pure. So just in case she thought about slipping, it's like, no, honey, you can't do that. You need to stay over here. You need to go here. So they was always around her to make sure no other man made an attempt to talk to her, try to seduce her, and she make sure that she stays straight herself. Uh, so after the betrothal, that's the marriage arrangement, and the marriage was now contracted. It was done. Matter of fact, the bridegroom had to bring something to the bride. Now watch this. We're representatives of the bride of Christ. And notice that once we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, he becomes our bridegroom and he gives us the kingdom. So before we was created, he created a gift for us, the kingdom. Before Adam, his son was created, the first, the first Adam was created, God built the earth for him to have dominion over. Now we have the second Adam, Christ, the bridegroom, who takes upon us, the children of God, the bride, and he gives us a gift, the kingdom, which is what Adam lost. He didn't lose heaven. That's God's resting place. He lost a kingdom. So when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not just going to heaven. You have access now to the kingdom. And he says, I've given you access to have dominion, to multiply, and to be fruitful. And that does not mean have children. That means multiply the wisdom and the gifts that he gave you to create opportunities of wealth, to create opportunities of building up, strengthening, and establishing his kingdom here on the earth. And we forget that sometimes. But let me go back to the wedding. Uh, you have the betrothal. You have the wedding procession. Uh, the wedding procession uh, is accomplished when the groom went to the house of the bride to fetch her. That's in Matthew 25 and 1 of Psalms 45. Or he sends a wedding party to fetch her to his home and he will go out to meet her. Uh, we see that in 1 Maccabees chapter 9, verses 37 through 39. Most of y'all don't know where Maccabees is. Maccabees is in the Bible that they call the Catholic Bible. And it's in what section they call the Apocrypha. And they call it the Apocrypha because they feel like it is not Holy Spirit inspired. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is historically stated. So you can get some history out of that to see how other things are done. So that's, that's uh, and I'm not telling you to buy it. I'm just sharing with you where the information comes from. Uh, then we have the wedding ceremony. At the wedding ceremony, the two are recognized to be husband and wife in a legal sense. Uh, then we have the wedding feast or the banquet that follows the wedding ceremony, of course. Then we have the wedding night. That's when the married couple become one in the flesh through the first sexual union. And you might recall, I share with you, the way, the way they were able to know that is the fact that uh, uh, they made love with a sheep. And if there wasn't no blood on that sheep, mm -hmm. somebody's going to get into some, don't say that real, somebody's going to get into some trouble. 
Uh, because you have to understand, it's a blood covenant. So when the man's, let's be honest, when the man's penis is in her vagina and her hymen is burst, it bleeds on that man and they, they make a blood covenant. That's why you're supposed to be virgins. Uh, it's a blood covenant. Now, you can still become spiritual virgins after you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, male and female, mm -hmm. and no longer have sex again. And once you have that marriage covenant, you are still made a covenant or a pact together. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Amen. Move on, Rev. Y'all good with that? Mm -hmm. So then we have the wedding procession, which is another idol. That was the third idol in the sixth reflection. So Solomon, ooh, I got to go. Uh -huh. Solomon, I ain't going to finish this in two nights, I see. Solomon sends a wedding party from Jerusalem to Galilee to fetch the Shulamite for the wedding ceremony in Jerusalem. Then you have the wedding night, which is the third idol as well, which is the seventh reflection. Uh, and then you have the consummation, which is the centerpiece of the Song of Songs. Uh, and notice here in chapter 1, verses 15, to chapter 4, verses 1 through 15, the man begins. In chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, in chapter 4, verse 16, she responds. The man begins, mm -hmm. she responds. Now, there's some eschatological, I can never pronounce that word, eschatological parallels. Of course, eschatological speaks of the end times. When you have the betrothal, you have the commitment. That's you committing yourself to the things of God. Then after that, you have the separation. Well, the separation is a time of preparation. Now, that's when the bridegroom is preparing the place. So, 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 so biblically or, or Hebraically, if you will, whenever the bridegroom made an agreement with the bride's parents that this is the woman he wanted to marry, and they had a contract, and he had to give up some gifts mm -hmm. to bring her in, he couldn't just go there broke. He had to take some stuff. Uh, 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 then there was a time of separation. And so the reason why the, 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 the virgins was waiting for the bridegroom to come because he goes back to his place, his father's house, and he builds an adjust, an, 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 a, a building adjacent to his father's house because legally in the Hebrew ways, the man did not work for a year. For a solid year, all he do was make sure that him and his wife got to know one another. So he didn't work. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we do that now? He, he didn't work. He just built a place onto his father's crib, and that was it. So basically, he, it was a time of preparation. Well, Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you, uh, and where I be, you may be also. Then there's the gathering of the bride, the gathering of the bride or the harpazio, the catching away, the catching away, the rapture, if you will. All of these parallels, all of these types, these sim similitudes, these, these allegories are in the Song of Songs and it's in the Jewish wedding. And then you have the wedding itself that's in the Father's house. Where is that wedding going to be? In heaven with the Lord God himself and the Lamb that has taken away the sins of the world, Jesus. Amen. The Holy Spirit is going to be present. That's the wedding in the Father's house. And then you have the wedding feast. And that's when Jesus takes that last sip of communion, that cup that he has not taken, because there's several cups of there's several drinks, cups of wine that they drink at the Passover. And, and you know, Christ said, look, I'm not going to drink this again until we fellowship in heaven with the father at the marriage <laughs> supper of the lamb. And there's one more cup to be drank. And that's in the kingdom with the king. Amen. So let's look real quick at hermeneutics. And remember, I alluded to this earlier about Hebrew hermeneutics. So here's what hermeneutics is. Hermeneutics is just the study of interpretation of the Bible. Uh, so when we go to school and get all these degrees, we take up a class in hermeneutics, and that's just the study of interpretation. Uh, some of the things I was taught in interpretation, they're not too correct today uh, because we've, we've understood some other things and we need to rewrite some books, but that's another subject. So I want to deal with the Hebrew hermeneutics because Hebrew hermeneutics is different from what we would consider to be Christian hermeneutics, if you will. Uh, so there's some parallelism of ideas. Uh, Hebrew poetry does not have rhyme or meter as our poetry does. Hebrew poetry consists of parallelism of ideas. Uh, there's uh, synonymous parallelism, antithetic or contrast parallelism, synthetic parallelism. So what is a synonymous parallelism? Uh, parallelism, yeah, parallelism. Uh, the second clause restates what is given in the first clause. So here we go. Proverbs 19, 29 reads like this. Judgments are prepared for scorners and strikes for the backs of fools. 
So the second clause literally states what was given in the first clause. It literally expresses the same in the beginning. So in strikes for the back of fools also tells you what happens to judgment uh, are prepared for scorners. So it expresses the same thought, but it expresses it in a different way. So that's a synonymous, a synonymous. Synonymous parallelism. Boy, that word will get you tonight. So sometimes every unit in one line is matched in the next line. Uh, this, of course, is called a complete synonymous parallelism. Um, so we'll get into now antithetic. I don't want to stay in there too long. Antithetic or contrast parallelism. Uh, that's when a truth which is stated in the first clause is made stronger in the second clause by contrast with an opposite truth. Proverbs 13 and 9. The light of the righteous rejoiceth but the camp of the wicked shall be put out. So you can see that the second statement is stating the same truth, but from an opposite point of view. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. Deacon Gary just texted me something stupid with his crazy self. <laughs> And it, and it popped out on the screen. That boy's insane. So again, the second statement is stating the same truth, but from an opposite point of view by way of contrast, if you will. Then we have the last one, uh, parallelism, is synthetic parallelism. Synthetic parallelism is when the second clause develops the thought of the first. We see this in Proverbs 20 and 2. The terror of a king is as the roaring of a lion. He that provoketh to him to anger sinneth against his own life. So the terror of a king is as the roaring of a lion, and he that provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own life. So in synthetic parallelism, the second line simply continues the thought of the first line. Now, sometimes the second line gives a result of the first line, and other times the second line describes something in the first line. Uh, so other things we deal with hermeneutics, and you know, if you're part of Kingdom Expectations, you know I teach this all the time, uh, is, the, is the different model of interpretation and different understanding as far as prophecy is concerned. In the Greek model, or, 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 or the, the way that, uh, the Western way, if you will, the Greek model, when you prophesy, you're waiting for a prediction and then you wait for fulfillment. The Hebrew model of prophecy is a pattern and the pattern takes you to an end. Now, I've always told people this. I'm always careful when people call themselves prophesying to me or ministering to me. Now, you got to understand what is prophecy. I'm going to teach that next uh, week after when I finish this. Because prophecy means to comfort, exhort, and edify. So a lot of times when people are ministering to you, it's not prophecy. It's the gift of word of wisdom or gift of word of knowledge. What is the gift of word of wisdom? The gift of word of wisdom is when I, or, or in our case, my wife, she's a prophetess, when one of us are ministering to you about your future things. The gift of word of knowledge is when we're ministering to you about your past and your present. So every time you're not happy with us ministering to you about your past and your present. So that doesn't make it prophecy because prophecy comes to comfort, exhort, edify. But again, we look at prophecy as prediction and then fulfillment to whereas the Hebrews look at prophecy as a pattern. So I look at every prophetical gift of word of wisdom, gift of word of knowledge that's been given to me, especially the gift of word of wisdom and prophecy. Every prophecy and every gift of word of wisdom that has been given to me, I've watched them all have the same pattern. Now, there's been a couple of times when some guys have conjured up some stuff that wasn't God. Hey, Paul. And when they conjured up something that wasn't God, I didn't pay any attention. Why? Because it didn't keep the pattern. So sometimes when people are ministering over our lives, we get all happy by what we hear and we're not paying attention to what's being said and not realizing that sometimes they miss the pattern. We good? Mm -hmm. So if we look at the Hebrew hermeneutics or the Hebrew interpretation, they're basically viewed in levels. There's the Peshat, which is the literal direct meaning. Then there's the Remez, which is an allegorical significance, a hint of something different, a hint of something deeper. Then you have the dirash, the homiletical or practical application. And then you have the sod, that's S-O-D, the mystical or hidden meaning. So, so when they look at the Hebrew hermeneutics, they're looking at the interpretation in levels. It's the pasat, the remez, the dirash, or the sod. Uh, of course, periodically they would interchange them, but that's the, the way they look, the four of them. Uh, and they actually break them down into a mnemonic, P-A-R-D-E-S. Uh, part A's. And it's funny, when you look at part A's in Hebrew, it actually means the garden or paradise. 
And if you follow that, you would like, you, it's, I like the garden of paradise because you know you won't go wrong. So we look at Psalm f chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, uh, campfire, and spink yard. So in that particular case, when we see orchard, uh, it comes from the Hebrew word pardace, P-A-R-D-A-C-E. Uh, is foreign origin, is similar to the Persian word for paradise. Uh, so, so these are the things that they look at at levels uh, when they look at stuff allegorically, especially in the Song of Songs. Um, we look at it from a Hebrew's perspective, and it has a totally different meaning, and we can get better insight into it, if you will. So we understand. Uh, real quick, I want to deal with something, and I'm not going to finish all of this tonight, so I thought I was going to do this in two weeks. Don't look like I'm going to do it in two weeks. Uh, one of the other things I want to deal with as far as uh, dealing with the Song of Songs is Solomon's identities. So in understanding and studying, we know that Solomon was his royal name. Solomon really wasn't his name. Don't that mess you up? Mm -hmm. That was his royal name. And we see that in plenty of places in the Hebrew, I mean, in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, there are certain names that are titles, and we think it's the people's names, but it's actually the titles. It's like this one dude, they call him the Rob Shaka, Rob Shaker, something like that. I just, just hear that name, I'm like, that's about a bad dude. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, so so that's, that's kind of amazing. That's kind of awesome. I, I like that. Um, so Solomon had some, some, some different identities. Uh, his royal name was Shalomo, Shalomo, S-H-E-L-O-M-O-H. You know, I'm not going to pronounce these as good as I need to. Uh, my, my tongue got dry. Uh, actually his name at birth by Nathan in second Samuel 12, 25 was Yedidiah, Yedidiah with a Y, Y-E-D-I-D-I-A-H. Uh, Bathsheba had a private pet name for him, Lem Lemuel. Uh, Proverbs 31. So it's kind of funny when he wrote Proverbs, but then you see these names in Proverbs and you're like, who is this guy? It was Solomon. Solomon himself in the book of Ecclesiastes called himself the preacher, the Koheleth. K-O-H-E-L-E-T-H. -E -E That's what Solomon called himself. He called himself the preacher. And then we have Agur, A-G-U-R, the collector of riddles. And that's in, in, uh, in Proverbs 30, riddles and dark sayings. It don't mean it was dark sayings like dark sayings but they were riddles and dark sayings that you had to you had to comprehend and figure out yourself uh solomon wrote over three thousand proverbs i got less than five minutes solomon wrote over three thousand proverbs that's in first kings 4 and 32 and was the wisest person in his particular day first kings chapter 4 verses 29 through 44 he lived 500 years before the seven wise men of greece and 700 years before the age of socrates plato and aristotle isn't that amazing uh, so there's some some different New Testament quotes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop this at uh, wisdom. I'm gonna do this little piece on wisdom, and you know I do as far as I can as we go into next week. Amen, amen. That that's a good hour. I think I think we did enough. I pray that you guys have been blessed. Uh, so let's look at wisdom. You know I've always been told not to pray for uh, patience because they always told me in church and growing up in ministry. I've been there a minute, that if you pray for patience, man, you're going to go through something. But I always say patience is just persisting through obstacles to get to the things of God. So patience didn't bother me. So I'm going to tell you what I learned to do. I asked God for wisdom. Now, that's a catch right there. Because when you ask God for wisdom, then situations come upon you that you have to think. You have to seek God's face. You have to grow in the things of God. I like asking God for wisdom. Patience just means I need to hold on a little bit longer. And wait for the promises of God to manifest. But now wisdom, that's a whole nother issue. Uh, but I still think you need to ask God for wisdom. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's just something I've learned. When he gives you wisdom, he gives you the strategies how to get through it. There you go. You heard mom, uh, prophetess, uh, doctor. When he gives you wisdom, he gives you the strategies on how to get through it. And you got to listen to them strategies. Yes. Amen. Because they come in pieces. They, <laughs> they do come in pieces. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Let me ask this question before I move. So traditional wisdom or the traditional definition of wisdom is the ability to use knowledge in the right way. But now the biblical uh, rendition or biblical definition of wisdom is there is a wisdom of the world, of this world, and then there's divine wisdom, which is from above. And Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. Proverbs 8, 22 uh, through 31 and uh, uh, 1, 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and 30 and Colossians 2 and 3. Uh, Isaiah said, yes, mom. Uh, so if we look at the Hebrew, wisdom is chakma, C-H-O-K-M-A-H. Uh, this word occur, occurs 45 times in Proverbs. It means being knowledgeable, experienced, and, in, in, and efficient in their areas of expertise. 
Wisdom in Proverbs includes practical sagacity, mental acumen, and functional skill, but it also includes moral, upright living, which stems from a right relationship to the Lord. And now what is a right relationship to the Lord? Well, Proverbs 9 and 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, that's just not regular fear. That's trembling fear. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. Uh, uh, that makes the Hebrew concept of wisdom very unique. Uh, so to be wise in the biblical sense, one must begin with a proper perception of the character of God. And then wisdom is described as eternal in Proverbs 8, 22 through 26. It is described as the creator of all things in Proverbs 8, 27 through 29. And is also uh, uh, described as the beloved of God in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 30 through 31. So basically to yield your life to Christ and to obey him is true wisdom. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. You yield your life to Christ and obey him. That's true wisdom. And if we want to live wisely, we must begin with a commitment to Jesus Christ, who himself is the wisdom of the world. First Corinthians. One and 30. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Apostle Pope. Actually, good night, Apostle Pope. I'm going to get ready to go. So look, I pray that you guys have been blessed. I, I pray that the word has blessed you. Uh, the allegorical view of the Song of Songs. Uh, so this might take two more nights, uh, but I'm going to do my best to get it out. I pray that you've been blessed. I pray that you gained some knowledge, some understanding. I want to say thank you to everybody who's come on. Thank you to everybody who's on. Thank you to everybody who's sharing it on their Facebook pages. Uh, uh, and this will be posted up on our church page. Uh, so we appreciate you all. Hey, Brother Denny, how you doing? Uh, I appreciate everybody. Uh, one of the other things I just want to acknowledge uh, presently, you know, the Lord has had, has a mandate on the ministry uh, that we're doing our best to do. But at present, we need some assistance with some covenant partners. So to be a covenant partner, you just go to Kingdom Expectations in a dollar, five dollars, twenty dollars a month, whatever the Lord places upon your heart. Uh, we're designed covenant partners so we can do better with our television equipment and we our ministries in India so we can continue to reach and grow the ministry as God sees fit. And of course, as always, we believe as you bless the ministry that the Lord will bless you 100 fold. Uh, so again, uh, that's those are things that we're designed for covenant partners. It's something I've not asked for in 30 years, uh, but the Lord placed that upon my heart to give access to those who desire to become covenant partners with the ministry. Just go to kingdomactexpectations.com and you'll see a little button that says donate. I hate the way they got it right there. That's the first thing you see. But we appreciate all you guys and we pray that you've been blessed. So as we prepare to depart from this camera, uh, amen, as you view in my kitchen. We pray that the Lord bless you and keep you, that the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, that the Lord let his, uh, did I mess that up? <laughs> See, I stuttered, I messed that up. <laughs> did I mess that up? The Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious upon you, the Lord lift up his conscience upon you and grant you peace in Jesus' name I pray. That's jacked up, but I got it in. Amen, y'all be blessed and be saved. This is Apostle Dr. Wright. And you know, just call me Doc. I'm out. Peace.